All right, guys, let's let's see if we can get onto ballistics too. All right, see if he's available. Think we could do ballistics too now? Um. Yeah. You want to you want to finish the ballistics video right now? Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So, people there in the camera, we started this like what July? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So there'll be some pieces we're gonna cut, put together. Then I'm going to uh, go over here and grab a whiteboard and stuff and sit down. We'll go through the ballistics, particularly the difference between a modern firearm and a modern pneumatic sporting device because the power sources are different. So therefore, they work differently. And we'll cover that. You also want to cover energy and how the states govern energy, the guidelines to set minimum levels, and how that leads into a terminal event, if memory serves. Is that correct? Yeah, don't forget we also have that ballistics box of your homemade ballistics oh, gel yeah, too. Oh yeah, I'll show you how to make your own ballistics gelatin and uh, I think we shot some... I think we shot some cinder blocks a while ago. We shot cinder blocks and we have a bunch of bullets and stuff and we'll try and piece all that together so what we'll do then is, is we'll go ahead and we'll do a little bit of talking, we'll do some clips, do some inserts, kind of piece it together so it, it's not gonna look like it's all shot in the same time period it's January now and we started last July so there'll be a little bit of different time period I'm gonna shut this stuff down and uh, we'll get to it so I went and got cleaned up a little bit sit back down here in the chair we are going to focus on energy and the sources of the energy first and that's the best place to start the difference between an expansion or increasing energy source and a diminishing energy source such as an, a pneumatic sporting device. Uh, the important thing to remember is, is you see a lot of advertisements out there, world's most powerful, blah, 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 I'm the greatest, this, that, and the other, because it's based on math. So hand me the whiteboard please if you would, and let's talk about the math. Oh, come on guys. So everything can boil down to math in one way or another. Now, when I was doing this stuff 30 some odd years ago, this was a mathematical formula that uh, we use. Now I look and they're not using that, they're using that. At some point, you know, we've really got to take a realistic look at some of these mathematical figures. I've got the most powerful gun because I shoot blah 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 at the muzzle. So this right here is a standard equation to determine how much energy is at the muzzle. Now why is that important? That number translates into a management number for the states because over a certain threshold you're said to have a terminal be able to create a terminal event at a given distance so you have the projectiles weight or mass times its velocity divided by 450 or current comma 437,000 um, and what this does is this gives you X now we're going to talk about the ways of getting X it's really not so much important as what is the muzzle of the firearm. It's what you actually deliver downrange that's important. And obviously, I can't talk without something to write with. So, what do I do with this? When we get, as we get into this, and we're going to start talking about expansion, so firearms, deflagrating powder, however you want to put a smokeless powder, black powder, it expands. We're going to cut away here and go to a little video with a little bit of a talk over and we're going to show a diminishing power source such as a pneumatic power source. What we've got to do is transfer enough energy to the projectile to push it down the barrel, get it out in the atmosphere, and then get it down range. But the key is to get it down range. Now, simply putting more PSI in doesn't necessarily equate into a higher velocity. And just because you have a higher velocity doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a better terminal event. In the ballistics video one that we shot, we went through what it takes to cause a terminal event. Now we're gonna talk about the projectiles and what, what you want to look for ideally, but there's also a time period in there where you may not want it to perform like that. And we're gonna to try to cover that with lots of examples, talk overs and some examples, and why they make projectiles the way they make them today. 
And there's a reason that they're made the way they are made today. And there's a way that modern pneumatic sporting devices can be incredibly efficient and accurate devices. So now let's cut away and uh, we're going to insert into some uh, field tests that we did. How many of you caught what was written on the whiteboard that they handed me? Just kind of a curiosity question. Now we're going to start with gunpowder. Now gunpowder itself is in expanding. We actually describe it in expanding ratios. So it starts out as a little tiny solid and it instantaneously and the change from solid to a, to a gaseous form as it expands is what we use to drive the projectile. And so Nick here is going to go ahead and he's going to light his little powder and it's going to go and when it goes off you're going to see it turn and expand violently as a matter of fact that's the reason why we use it for explosives as well as to propel modern firearm projectiles the best way I found to describe the energy source a diminishing energy source is use the garden hose that you see here so we have the same amount of pressure and by simply um, locking it off and then releasing it quickly it creates a surge or a pulse as shown with this garden hose and it, it isn't an expanding or a growing that we had with the uh, the gunpowder this is just simply just a spurt if you will and we're just releasing PSI we cut away and you got to see the expanding gases that we use a propellant and you also got to see a diminishing energy source. In this particular case we use a garden hose. Now why this is important? You have gases expanding at an incredibly high rate. You're going to push that projectile using those gases. Even after the projectile is gone you have a muzzle flash that's unburnt powder. As oxygen hits it, 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 it tends to burn more. So you can get incredibly high velocities because this gas is moving and it's actually pushing it down the barrel. With a diminishing energy source, such as with the garden hose that I had set up, so it just basically spurted, you have a fixed PSI in the garden hose. You, you constrict it, you block it off, and you let it go, and you block it off, and you let it go, and it creates a pulse. And this is what we're trying to use. The problem with it is it doesn't expand all the way down the barrel. What you're going to see with a lot of the modern pneumatic rifles is they use really, really long barrels to try and get as much energy as they can because the gas obviously wants to move faster than it can push the projectile. So you can gain more by getting a long barrel. Our goal at uh, Modern Pneumatic Sporting Devices, a GA brand, is to try and use a 24 inch barrel or a short barrel, get the same type of velocities out. So we're kind of bridging the gap between the uh, firearms world and the traditional air gun world so that we have a good sporting rifle. Now as you have a diminished power source it means you're going to have less velocity. You're going to lose it faster due to air resistance. Terminal events that you're trying to create by using your projectile out of a modern pneumatic sporting device is a little bit more challenging. So you're going to need more out of that projectile than you do out of a modern firearm because it has velocity on its side. Mass times velocity and what it delivers to the actual target. You have a diminishing power source, you actually have less energy that you're imparting on the target. So the quality and the construction of the projectile becomes incredibly important in what you're asking it to do. Because again, trying to bridge the gap between modern firearms, air guns, but it's not the theoretical energy you have at the muzzle. It's what you actually deliver into the target. So now we're going to break away and we're going to show you some experiments that we did. We're going to show you how you can create your own experiments using a slurry box so you know before you go exactly what your device is going to do, how well it's going to work, and what you can expect in a terminal event. We've got Nick shooting in the background here while we're doing this demonstration, but we're going to carry on. Here we have a quick and easy method of making your own ballistic simulant. You can take a cardboard box, reinforce it a bit with some duct tape. Be sure to choose a big enough box uh, that'll keep the bullet in. You place in a garbage sack in the bottom, place it in the bottom, and pull it out on all sides so you can put another sack in on top. You can, you can put multiple sacks in, five or six, whatever you want. And well, the idea of this is 
once I get some socks in here, you're going to see. This way, what you can do is, is you can set it up, and then after you use it, you can simply push that down inside. It just adds to the ballistic material. Pull another sack up that we're going to demonstrate. So right now, I'm going to go out and get some paper, newspaper, whatever, and a garden hose. We're going to get some water in it. Kind of like cooking, you know, but I'm a horrible cook. And it does take a while while you're filming. And you want to rip your paper up. Paper shreds, any, any real kind of paper. You can use cardboard, it doesn't matter. So long as you can mix it up into a paste-like slurry. When you get your box pretty well full, uh, then you can actually just simply take it out and shoot it. Now the really, really cool thing about this is, is when you it's all said and done, you drain the water off. And you can literally just throw it away in the garbage. It's 100% green as it were. Uh, it's a neat way to do it. Lots of paper, lots of water, make yourself a paste. Now for you real realists, you can, you know, use, throw some bones in there too. From your favorite pork chop or something. And uh, just in case a projectile hits it on its way through. Now you've got your box. Obviously, you would want it much fuller. And so let's say you've shot. Oh, no, I've got a hole in it. You've recovered your projectile. You simply pull the bag up from the bottom. And you're ready to do it again. Expand. And with that, I'll let Nick up here and he's going to take a shot. Carl and Nick here with uh, ETA. In this section of our Ballistics 2 video that we're doing, I want to address specifically the idea of energy transfer now. In the rest of the segments that you've seen before this and then some stuff that's coming after us, you're going to see it's filmed at different times because it took us a while to put this all together. You know, it, it does take some time. As a result, what you've got is you've got a much colder day. Obviously, you can see it's fall. There's been some information put out on the internet about the most powerful air rifle, the most powerful this or that. And as discussed earlier in this segment, it's kind of a mathematical equation. In fact, it is a mathematical equation. And so what they're talking about is, is the weight of the bullet, how fast it goes, the potential energy right here. That's wonderful. Great. What we're talking about is actually delivering that to your target medium in order to create a terminal event. And the best way to do that is to have something that transfers the energy properly. Now recently on the internet there are some cinder blocks shot uh, to show you know how powerful it is at close range. So we're going to do the same thing only today we're at about 43 yards because it honestly it's just what's convenient. We just finished another filming segment. So Nick here is going to grab one of these copper bullets, which is a normal off-the-shelf bullet. He's going to shoot a cinder block down here. We've got some cameras on it. And we're going to see what it looks like because what we're concerned about is the energy transfer at the target. So I'll kind of step back a little and let him shoot.
So this is not flesh. It does not act like flesh, but it does offer resistance. The question is, is how well did the projectile stay together and yet mushroom so that it can provide the energy necessary to give you the penetration? You, you saw it. You saw the bullet land. I came up. I picked it up. Here's the projectile. Approximately 50% of the projectile is still intact. Therefore, it has the mass to penetrate, and yet the face of it mushroomed. Now, granted, this isn't uh, simulant for flesh, but it does kind of give a dramatic effect of what you want. It still stayed together. Now, in a minute, uh, we're going to flash off here, and I'm going to show you some that don't stay together and kind of give you an idea of where did the energy go. This transfers everything into the target, and it expands to at least twice its diameter. This kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking for for a terminal event. We're back at the table. We just gathered up our stuff. So the first thing I want to show you is what happened when we performed the test with lead. Now, we're not about pulling any of the wool over anybody's eyes. We shot this test a lot of times into a lot of different target medium. Uh, as you, those of you that are watching this video, obviously you're going to see our homemade gelatin box, but uh, our ballistics medium. Lead just literally it would crack the block, sometimes you may get a hole. It, it really didn't do much. It just basically hit, splattered, that was it. Different brands of bullets. Uh, here's an example where the case came off of it. Then we have a whole variety here where nothing happened. So you can imagine if you're hunting and shooting a concrete block, you don't get any expansion at all. You don't get anything. It, it rolls the front over and this one we picked up about 12 feet back from the cinder block and uh, some of these we picked back up from the flat plates that you just saw they hit they bounce off you know now granted this isn't the same as flesh however this is a lot harder it offers more resistance these two here though they do work and they work very well they stay together um, again, lead, lead splatters does very little damage. These shatter the blocks or puncture them. These others may go clean through or they simply hit and bounce off. So when you want a terminal effect, you need to be able to have something that's going to, once again, just as in video one, you need it to expand twice its diameter. You need to maintain 50% of the projectile's mass so that it will penetrate. Now, if it branches off into what they call secondary missiles or projectiles that we talked about in video one, that's even better. It does more damage. So when you gentlemen are out there testing, ladies and gentlemen, you need to test what you have so you know what it is. You need to know your velocities and what it's capable of. You need to get a certain amount of penetration. You have to have enough energy to get it through. Simply knowing what the muzzle velocity is, doing the equation, doesn't give you the exact information necessary to know how that energy is transferred into the target. All right, let's see if we can get us to finish this video. Hey, you ready to finish ballistics two now? Um, okay. Now <laughs> you brought my whiteboard. Hey, okay. I did. All right, so let's see if we left off. Uh, last summer we went out and we shot a bunch of bullets. We shot it into the, the ballistic slurry. We also shot it again, some concrete blocks. And we had some bullets that expanded uh, very well. And then we had some that didn't. Now, as a general rule, the ones that don't is what you don't want. However, there is an exception to the rule. And that exception is, is once you've gone outside of the operational parameters of your pneumatic sporting device, what you don't want is you don't want the projectile to open up too much and lose all of its energy as it goes into the animal as you attempt to create a terminal event. Thereby, you're not going to get the penetration, you're not going to get the terminal event. So the best of all worlds is to have a bullet work within its operational parameters, which is what you're supposed to have. But if you happen to stray outside of it, you want it to stay a solid. And that's so that you can get in, it can do something called yawing. So once it gets into the flesh, once it gets into the flesh, if this is our... Uh, our, our bullet here. Now, of course, all bullets are, you know, sharks. 
So as it gets into and it goes into the flesh and it stays as solid because its velocity is too low, but fortunately you've chosen a projectile with enough mass to allow momentum to get the penetration in. Uh, it'll get into the flesh and as it enters into the flesh, it'll create a wound cavity. Then it'll begin to dis um, yaw. And as it begins to yaw, it'll begin to spin. And this motion will cause it to tear and rip. And you will be able to get penetration, create a terminal event at a longer distance than what you normally would if you went with an expanding only. However, one must be careful. You shouldn't count on this because you do want your projectiles to expand. However, we found that if you have a bullet that's constructed properly, you can go outside of the normal range and still have an excellent terminal effect. Now, again, to repeat, you want your projectiles to expand to twice their diameter. You want them to retain 50% of their mass so that you have enough mass for penetration. But should you get outside of that, you want your projectile to stay together so it's more like a solid so that you can get the penetration because it's the penetration that allows it to get into the vitals. We covered that in ballistics number one. And if you haven't seen ballistics video one number one, you need to go to it. Now let's recap all these videos it's taken almost a year to do to get all this stuff together. So what we have is we have the mass and the velocity. Oh, I digress. A little earlier in this video when they handed me this board, what did it say on it? Those of you that take the time to back up and look at, at it, Send us a note of what it is and maybe we'll send you a shirt or something. I don't know, but it's kind of fun. So let's go back to this. And the new equation 437. This is like a pendulum. The heavier the bullet, the slower the velocity can be and you can still get an acceptable X. Why is X important? X, as I said earlier in the videos, is what a lot of governing agencies use to determine the terminal effectiveness of a firearm, a modern pneumatic device. The heavier the bullet, the slower the velocity beam. The higher the velocity, the lighter the bullet can be because there's always an operational parameter. Now, uh, as an example, in Washington State, you have to have a certain diameter of a projectile of a certain weight to generate 900 foot-pounds at 100 yards. They're not interested in what's at the muzzle. They're interested in what actually goes into the animal at your average impact distance. So as states begin to mandate regulations for your lower power, your 100 power pound air rifles and such, really may not be able to get the terminal effectiveness that you want. Other states say 230, 350 foot-pounds, what have you. But what they're doing is, is that gives them some measure so people don't get out there with stuff that they shouldn't. But this is very, very easily regulated. You can have a heavy bullet going slow, a light bullet going fast. The only way for the states to regulate it again is, is by determining what that threshold needs to be. So when you go to look at guns, you go to look at your new modern pneumatic air rifles and stuff, don't be all impressed with this number. Too many things go into it. Once you're above a certain threshold, it's within the operational parameters, and give you the terminal effectiveness that you want, that company's probably producing an excellent device for you. What you need to do is you need to monitor and learn what these are, what's acceptable in your area, so that you know what will work for you.